Voices to Hear. Uh, hello everyone and welcome to Voices to Hear. My name is Katarina and uh, I'm joined today by Nyonsa Zaferi. Uh, in this episode we will talk about Nyonsa's music background and uh, what music uh, means to her. So Nyonsa, please tell me something about yourself. Okay, uh, my name is Nyonsa Jaferi. I'm 26 right now and I started playing the piano when I was six. So I've been doing it for 20 years. Oh, that's a long time. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> kind of long time. <laughs> yeah, but I'm never bored of it. I I feel like every year I just love it more and more and more. So yeah. it's it's always interesting. It's just new layers and new levels. Yeah, it just gets better and better. It's like fine wine. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's actually good good way to uh, say describe it. Okay. Yeah, I think the more you mature, the more you learn to appreciate it. Yeah, just like. Like, because when you're a kid, you're like, oh, this is so cool. And then you're older and you're like, oh, this means so much. Yeah. That's true. That's true. So can you please tell me about uh, more about your musical background? Sure. I uh, grew up in a diplomatic family. So my dad was a diplomat. Uh, he's still a diplomat. What do I say? <laughs> uh, so um, when I was six, we moved to Switzerland And I first started uh, the piano and uh, with my uh, teacher, Michel Sipahi Dumas, just uh, lessons in uh, Geneva, Switzerland. And mm -hmm. I also took like solfeggio lessons as well, because they kind of go together. Okay. You have to have, you have to have both. Yeah. And I, I loved her. She, I cool. think to this day, she's my favorite teacher. Yeah. <laughs> But um, no, like Michelle, she was so cool. She she had uh, two adoptive children. So she was a Caucasian Swiss woman and her husband was a very famous violinist, actually, mm -hmm. yeah. in, in Switzerland. So they were both like the like the dream team, yeah. you know, and they they could have had children of their own, but they chose to adopt two kids from India okay. and Again, another thing that I took from her, like, now I'm older and I want to adopt. So oh, I'm just yeah. like that. I don't know. I grew up with her and her family. Like, we were very close. Yeah. And the lessons that I had, um, she would come over to my house. Because, like, we had um, a piano at, at my house. Like, my my parents um, leased it for two months just to see how I would react. <laughs> and then I just really fell in love with it. So they bought it. And oh, I have the same piano to this day. We moved it okay. from Switzerland. We brought so it here. Yeah. So that same piano has been with you like 20 years. Yeah, my whole that's, life. That's yeah. crazy, really. That's so. But uh, after Switzerland, where have you? Um... Uh, we came back here. So I think wherever we would go, we would have uh, to come back to our home country. So I would come back to Skopje yeah. every time. We were in Switzerland for like four years. Okay. So I came back here in the when I was for the fourth grade. I was nine. Yeah. And I mean almost ten. Uh, but. It, it was really, it was such a culture shock to me because my parents took me to an Albanian school and everything that I learned was French because when you're plastic, like, you just pick up on things. Yeah. And, I mean, I spoke Albanian when I was very, very young, like two, three, four, five, but once you're in school, you just start absorbing what you hear all the time. Yeah. And it was pretty funny because I just... The, the longer we were there, the more I would speak in French, even to my parents. Yeah. Like, I would understand Albanian, but it got to the point where I had a hard time speaking it. Yeah, it's more comfortable to speak. French and my mom had to take French courses to learn French because she had no idea what I was saying. Oh. <laughs> so after uh, uh, Skopje, you went somewhere else? To... We went to New York City. Oh, really? I was there for a year. And I, I had two teachers there. I had the teacher that was at the school. Yeah. Uh, his name was Henry Solo. And I think it's funny that his last name was Solo and he was a music teacher. But, <laughs> you know. And then uh, there was another, funnily enough, another piano teacher in the same building as me. Yeah. And she had just, uh, she was on maternity leave. She had just given birth. And her daughter was very quiet and peaceful and she was bored so she was like come come let's have lessons <laughs> yeah so that was fun and yeah. then we came back here mm. and um i uh i did 
two high schools at once. When I did the first year at the normal high school, so like Zeflush Marko is the name, okay. um, I continued that one, but I didn't go there regularly. I would just uh, do three exams every two months. Okay. But the exams, I would pick three subjects and um, I would do an exam per subject, but the exam was the material for the entire year. So let's say if I chose... I don't know, English, uh, math, and I don't know, psychology, yeah. I would have to learn everything that they would learn in a year. I would learn it in like a month and then I would, or like two months. Would, yeah, and then so. I would just do the exam and just get it over with. So that's what I did with Zeflush, with like the regular high school. And with the music high school, I started over. So I, I was a first year there while I was a second year in the other one. So it was kind of, it was kind of messed up. Yeah, it's kind of confusing. <laughs> it's a little confusing, but I was going to the music school regularly because yeah. I felt like I had to. Yeah. And so I was just doing both. So this one was just regular life and that one was with exams that I would go to every two months. Yeah. But I also took two years and one. So I ended up graduating from the regular one when I was 16. And then I graduated from the music one when I was 18. Well, it was a lot. <laughs> it's a lot, but I still uh, appreciate it that you follow your passion. Like, that's very nice. Yeah, but, I don't think I could quit on it even if I wanted to. <laughs> but did you have uh, in any, any time like a feeling that you have to, you want to quit the music? Like, like... Any frustration or something like that? I mean, yeah, of course. Yeah. Of course. Everyone has. <laughs> of every, yeah, I think no matter what you do, no matter what profession you have, mm -hmm. like there will be a period, I think especially with arts, because yeah. we're so um, self-critical. Yeah. And I think that we really um, put our self-value um, in direct correlation with our art. Yeah. So if you are not a good artist or if you think you're not a good artist, you immediately think that you're not a good person. Yeah. So I think it's very important to have that boundary, which I think uh, a lot of musicians, writers, painters, whatever kind of art you're into, it's really hard to yeah. kind of um, differentiate yeah. <laughs> your professional self from your personal self. So I think gro growing up, that was a very big struggle for me. Because if I did well, then I was like, oh, I'm worthy. And if I didn't do well, I was like, oh, I hate myself. But it's uh, kind of understandable. It's a big part of your free time as well. So basically you are... It's all of my yeah, time. Yeah, so yeah. It's, it's understandable that you, you have like a lot of self-criticism about that as well. That you are not enough good and you want to do things better. But that's also yeah. tells of how important part it, it is about your life, so... Well, it matters. Yeah. And I think sometimes when things matter that much, they're bound to cross some boundaries even in internally within yourself. And you might just... It, it can be painful yeah. because it matters so much. Yeah. But it's okay. I've um, Even if I wanted to quit, mm. uh, which I've been frustrated enough to... To, th to just genuinely it was like I'm done yeah but there's just something that never really let me yeah I was way more miserable without it uh, than I was ever while I was struggling, struggling with something yeah and I think that says a lot and now like I'm starting to have students of my own and everything and they're uh some of them are you know, 12, 13, 14, and they're, they're thinking about where they want to kind of orient themselves professionally, whether they want to continue in a more serious way or not. Mm -hmm. And they, and also their parents just come to me and, and they just say, oh, well, like, how, how do we know? What do we do? Like, it's so hard uh, for artists nowadays to just kind of like be successful mm -hmm. or have a s stable job yeah. and and everything so how do we how do we choose yeah and i i think that those are the wrong questions to ask yourself you mm. shouldn't ever think oh well will i will i be successful will i make money will i be famous 
will I be good enough? Will people like me? Will people like what I sound like? Yeah. It doesn't matter. That's true. I think what really matters is, can I live without this? And if the answer is yes, then maybe do something else because this is really hard. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. if the answer is no, then go ahead and have no regrets then you following will. your passions. Yeah. Because this is just who you are. And mm -hmm. there's nothing out there for you exactly. other than this. And then you know that you are in good way. Like you are doing the no right. No matter what happens, yeah. you know that this is the only way. Yeah. But I really want to ask you still uh, about your future plans. What you want to do? Okay, so my uh, goal is to... I would love to be a college professor. Mm -hmm. I would love to teach uh, piano at a university level. I mean, kids are great, but I really um, love discussing art. And mm -hmm. I really like the psychological aspects of it as well. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to uh, do a specialization in my field and then get a PhD as well. Yeah. So I want, you know... Even more school than I've already had oh, so yeah. far because why not? why not? You can never have too many diplomas. No, that's true. You, you can study as much as you want. Yeah, I mean, I I really love learning. Yeah, I love learning, and I think I mean I've had all kinds of teachers, but the 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 good ones that I've had in my life have, have actually motivated. Have real no, not only that, they've literally changed my life. Oh. So I I think that's nice. I would love to be that yeah. for someone else one day. That's very nice goal, really. It's beautiful goal. Thank you. And I would also, I mean, as a as a professor, you you also have a lot of free time. Mm. So I would also love to perform, <laughs> because let's say my uh, my professor in Zagreb, like Philip, uh, he would just casually go on tour in China for a month and then to the equator for three weeks and but he was also a, like he never stopped teaching us yeah. like he was always present so I really like that kind of balance yeah. of personal uh, projects and, and then, being yeah. involved in other people's growth yeah. and I think that's a very um, important age as well like 18 to 22 or you know, whatever, that college and master's uh, period. Mm. I think that's when people really get to know themselves and they mature. And I think it's really important to have the right person kind of guide you through that process yeah. because it can be very confusing to find out who you are just on a personal level, but also as an artist, okay, what do I want to sound like? Who do I want to be like? Who am I? What is my sound? What are my strengths? What do I need to work on? Yeah. It's, it's, it's a lot. So yeah. I think it, it can change everything. It can mean the world to have a, like a really good mentor. Yeah. But also, if you if people want to like uh, have like questions, uh, answers for these questions, you really have to put like a lot of time and effort. Is it, oh, for example, if it's like music, then it's it doesn't happen like uh, like a few mo like not months. I mean years. It really needs like a long, long time for that. It takes a lifetime. Yeah. Th there was this one uh, cellist. God, I forgot who it was. God, this is so embarrassing. I think it was Rospovich, maybe maybe one other famous cellist, and he kept uh, doing concerts when he was in his eighties. He was like 84 years old and people were asking him like, why do you keep, why aren't you retiring yet? Yeah. And he was like, well, I still have so much left to learn. Yeah. But it's the same. It's not about music. It's uh, in general about life. Like uh, many people that I know that they are 16 or even older and they still say to me that I still don't know what I'm going to do with my life. So don't stress about that so much. Exactly, exactly. And I think the thing that uh, I learned the most, well, personally, the most important thing that I learned from the teachers that were really uh, hands-on in, in my life and in my progress was to learn how to just kind of be comfortable with my vulnerability, which is something that I um, struggled with a lot. I, I still do, <laughs> but I'm, I'm slowly getting better better yeah. and just to kind of be an ambassador for love even though that 
sounds super cliche, <laughs> but uh, but some cliches are true. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And um, there, there's one of my favorite pianists of all time, Rubinstein. When I remember his interview, like the back of my hand, I was obsessed with it. And they asked him, um, "Why, why are you, why are you a pianist? Why, why do you do this? Yeah. Why, why is this important to you?" And he's like, "What do you mean? I am in love. Well, <laughs> what else is there to say?" What else should I say? Nothing. That's the answer. And I'm like, that's so good. That's yeah. so good. I can't explain to you because when you're on stage, it's terrifying. Yeah. Like I shake. Like to this day, I'm like, oh, yeah. and I sweat and I feel like vomiting, and yeah. it's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> you go out there and it's just like it's so stressful. It's, it's so horrible. scary. Yeah. And I think. I, I love that he got to the point where he was like, I love this more than I am afraid. Yeah. I love this more than I, uh, more than the voice in my head that tells me that I'm not good enough, more than my uh, own self-critic. Yeah. So he just put that above everything else. And at the end of the day, that's what's the most important part of any art. Yeah. <laughs> to just like really remember that you're doing this because you love it. And you're doing this to share it so that other people can feel it too. So you, for you, the how you get over if you're afraid or stressed when you go perform or have like an um, audition, then you're playing. It's because you love it so much. But do you have any other like uh, secret secrets that you want to share about how you get over Ooh, that? Yes, yes. Uh, I don't think it ever goes away. Yeah, it will never go away. If you're the type of person that Uh, you get anxious when you go on stage when you were six years old, you're gonna get anxious when you're 66 years old, okay? It's never gonna go away, it's always terrifying. You just get comfortable being terrified. Yeah. But I had this one colleague uh, in Zagreb who gave me wonderful advice. Because uh, he, whenever he went on stage, he was so confident and just really fearless. And he was so mesmerizing to watch and to listen. And I went up to him one day, I'm like, how do you do this? And he said, muda na ledu, which means you take <laughs> your ball sack and you just dump it in a bucket of ice. <laughs> so I think, I think it's really important to just be brave. Yeah. And it's, it's helped me be brave in many other areas of life as mm -hmm. well. So I think whatever we learn from art can be applied to everything. It's made me less afraid to have very difficult conversations or to take more opportunities mm. to just put myself out there, even if I get rejected. Yeah. Just be brave in everything that you do. And you'll ultimately end up growing as a person and being better for it yeah. at the end of the day. Yeah. Do you have a lot of experience about uh, like uh, performs? Yeah, yeah. Um, all of all of our exams are in the form of a concert. If you're a performer, so th th that's what your exam is. Okay. There's like an, uh, a panel of judges. Oh, of stressful. Yeah, it's so bad. <laughs> yeah, doesn't it's so sound bad. so comfortable? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're, it's just, it's terrible because when you're at a concert, it's a different feeling because you know that people are here to, they don't care. They're yeah. just here to enjoy themselves. They're yeah. here to have a good time. And as long as you're having a good time, they're going to have a good time. Yeah. So the atmosphere is more relaxing because you feel supported by the audience. But whenever you have exams, especially important exams, it's just four people. Four professors with their little notes, just waiting for you to make a mistake. And you're like, God damn it. Well, that's not helpful at all. Yeah, so it's really stressful. But I think if you can get through that, you can get through anything. Yeah. And you get through it. You got through it. So yeah, you're but, still alive. Yeah, but you know, like I've been to concerts, for example, at the Philharmonics, and I see people, and I hate these people, <laughs> who show up there with the score. Yeah. With the music notes, and as it's playing live, they just <laughs> go through their little booklet. And I'm like, you have no idea how stressful that is for the performer, because you can literally 
like see so they everything they're doing. They read the note when you are playing. The yeah, sensor. they read the notes while you're playing in real really? time, and that's I think the worst thing because you're like, they should God. Not do that. And they always sit in the first row too, and I'm like, okay, I'm glad that you're a fan. Well, can you at least sit in the back so I don't have to see <laughs> at least you? I don't have to see you. Oh God, this is hard. Just, it's like I you're reciting a poem. That. Yeah, it's like you're reciting a poem, and somebody's there with the book, seeing exactly. <laughs> when you like, okay. make a mistake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you say a different word, like they'll know, they'll point it out to you. So I think that those are like one. Of, those are very stressful things. Yeah. So, and I think that's why we feel so much pressure when we go on stage because yeah. we want it to be perfect. Yeah. We want it to be the closest thing to mm -hmm. the authentic experience that you can get from, from a score. Yeah, but I think it's very important also for people who doesn't um, have like performed so much that uh, also people who do go on stage like uh, many times in their life, they're struggling with that a lot as well. Of course. And I think it doesn't just have to be music performance. I mean, it's the same with public speaking. Yeah. It's the same when you have to uh, have a presentation in front of your colleagues. Mm -hmm. It's the same with other exams, yeah. with oral exams and things like that. So it's good to have like some techniques yeah. if, if you need them to just kind of get through it and yeah. practices. That's true. I had uh, one of my professors here in Skopje, Elena Tanasova. I, I love her. She's also one of my favorite teachers. Uh, she did her PhD on stage fright. Oh, okay. And she managed to categorize people in four different groups mm -hmm. based on their level of comfortability and need yeah. uh, on, on stage. And the first category was people who were just like naturally confident and charismatic and they didn't really need they didn't really stress out about it yeah. and then it just gets progressively worse and worse right and the fourth category is people who just really like they kind of shit, shit themselves at the thought of having to go perform in front of people so she had all of these different methods i'll send you her dissertation it's, it's quite interesting but yeah, it's it's good that. to see that some people really don't need practice and mm -hmm. other people need to really, really practice a lot, like go on stage, let's say, every other day yeah. in order to feel comfortable. So I think there are people who are talented in their in this context yeah. of uh, public speaking or, or public performing, and there are others who need to practice it. So it's, it's never you. Mm -hmm. It's just, oh, I have this talent, I don't have this talent. It's fine. Just like, oh, I can draw. I need to practice drawing, which is fine. Yeah. So it's never like, oh, I am terrible. Oh, my, my anxiety eats me alive. I can't do this. There's no such thing as can't. Yeah. It's actually because uh, me and my cousin, we sometimes um, have a like, um, we go on stage, like small stage, but still like together and playing piano, like a uh, mm -hmm. like, uh, duo. Yeah. And uh, I'm the person who is sweating and stressing and just like panic. I cannot go there, even though it's a small audition in our small village, and there literally I know everyone matter. there. But I'm still like oh, I cannot go there, and my cousin's just like I there, let's go. It doesn't matter if it's going bad or not. We are just having fun there. Yeah, I both love and hate those people. <laughs> Yeah, but the thing is that I, for me, it's uh, getting a little bit more comfortable after that. Like, because uh, I know yeah, that the, the, the more often you do it, the yeah. the more comfortable you get. Yeah, and also because I know that the other person, uh, she's feeling okay and she's not stressing so much, so f I'm not that stressed as well. So for me, it's always better if there is another person as well. At the stage oh, me at too, the same time. me too. This is why I love uh, collaborating with other musicians, yeah. especially if it's like trios, quartets, quintets, yeah. uh, whatever, because you really feel uh, this support. Yeah. You're like, I'm, I'm not gonna mess up, but even if I do mess up, there's another person. Yeah. So that just kind of gives you some relief. That's true. And you know that they, they have your back, no matter what happens. And when you're a soloist, you, you have a lot of pressure, because yeah. if you mess up, that's on you. That's true. Horrible. So that, that, that's a lot. I think there's a difference. But then some people hate performing with other people because they're like, if they mess up, the whole thing goes to shit. 
So I they hate like, they hate doing that, but they feel more comfortable in their own yeah. solo abilities. But yeah. I'm not. I was that person when I was like younger, like in elementary school. I was a person. I will not go with other person on stage. I will do it on your own. And then now Same. I'm just like I don't want to go there alone. So. It's an opposite way. It changes, yeah. yeah. For for me, it's the same. I f- I feel better when when I'm uh, making music with other people as well. Because yeah. I also forget about the audience. I just focus on the person that I'm working with. Yeah. And everything just kind of becomes blurry. Yeah. But I think it's nice to be like in that zone mm. when when you're performing. And uh, another really good advice that I got from my professor Vlasta in in Zagreb, she said um, that fear is evil. So I'm like, okay, laziness is evil and fear is just laziness. You're not engaged enough. That's why you're afraid. And when you're afraid and you're not engaged, bad things happen. So that was her philosophy. Yeah. And I really liked that. And she kind of, because I was, it was my final exam and I was just freaking out. And, and she was like, listen, it doesn't matter. You've, you've done everything. It doesn't matter what you sound like. Uh, and I know everything that's going uh, through your head. Will they like me? Will it be good enough? What kind of grade will I get? What, what, will, what will happen after I graduate? You know, it was just very stressful. Yeah. And she's like, none of those things are important. You're just going to say... I don't care. I have so much to do. You go out there and you just focus on getting it done. You focus on doing everything that you want to do. You focus on getting in the zone. You focus on translating these sounds into feelings and worry about that. Don't worry about everything outside of your own head that's trying to interfere with that. That's a good advice, really. She's wonderful. Yeah. You had a lot of good uh, teachers. I've had a lot of bad teachers as well. I'm just yeah. not talking about yeah, them. <laughs> you can tell them as well. But but the good mm-hmm. ones, the good ones really, they they were really, yeah. they they really influenced my life in a really drastic way. So I'm very grateful for them. But it's good. Uh, it, I I can say that uh, you remember first the good ones. That's that's a. Uh, like good part of that like uh, because sometimes it can happen that if you think about your teacher first you will remember the bad one and the bad size of what happened but I think in your case it's more about you really you really appreciated your teachers and get a lot of inspiration about them and want to be like a kind of like not same person but take a good size for them. Yeah, like, yeah. Good, I think I think part. it's really important. Yeah. I don't uh think everyone uh is deeply influenced by their teachers but i think as a pianist um all of your uh education uh the entire process of education the lessons are one on one it's not a classroom yeah and you don't have a book where you can just do it on your own so your your entire career is heavily dependent on your mentor yeah so i think that's why in this context specifically it's very um, important to have the right one because the right one can just really transform you into the best version of yourself and you will be the happiest because everything's going well. Mm-hmm. And, and we talked earlier about like how Im- hard it is to differentiate your professional life from your personal life. So when your professional life is going well, you will also be happy mm-hmm. <laughs> as a person. Yeah. Because, I mean, what's the difference between an artist and a regular person anyway? Like, it's hard to kind of find that line, yeah, right? Like, I think the there whole is, identity. Yeah. It's, it's a whole psychological. Yeah, yeah. There is no so uh, strict line about that, so. Yeah, and when you have a bad teacher, it feels like your entire world is just crumbling. Because you're like, okay, everything is so negative. Because you're yeah. like, well, I I can't seem to be... to to get this right. I can't seem to be doing well on stage. I'm just so nervous. Mm. I, I don't think I'm good enough. I don't think I'm worthy. Why am I even doing this? Maybe my mother was right. I should have been a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I've had teachers like that as well. I've even had teachers who are downright abusive. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's not talk about that. Okay. But I think um, because I've had teachers like that, whenever the good ones showed up, it just made all the difference. Mm-hmm. 
And it was really like this eureka moment for me yeah. <laughs> where I was like, okay, well, I am a good <laughs> person and a good artist and a good pianist and everything. And I'm so glad that that person was wrong. And then as I grew up, I just kind of start to understand that everyone has problems mm. and not a lot of people have the emotional capacity or maturity to handle it well. Uh, and you just kind of learn to have empathy for even the problematic people in your life. Yeah. Uh, even the people that have hurt you in whatever way in your life. And at the end of the day, at the very least, you know what not to do. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, this was good for... And n nobody is a strictly bad teacher or strictly good teacher. Everybody's kind of mixed. It's just a balance. Mm. So even like the quote-unquote bad ones, even they taught me something worthwhile yeah. at, at the end of the day. So yeah, I think, I think at least in, in this profession and in this context... It's a very important role yeah. over someone else's life. <laughs> I just keep listening to you and just like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> Do I have any questions for you? <laughs> Maybe not. We can still continue, but I think this podcast is... I mean, we can talk for like four more hours. I, I have so much just, to say. We can just spend our like whole Friday night here and just oh, talk yeah. about music. Like, oh, this yeah. Is, this is like never-ending conversation. <laughs> okay, Nyomsa, thank you so much for participating for this podcast. This was a pleasure for me. It was such a pleasure for me. Thank you so much for having me. This was so much fun. That was... And anytime you want to have another podcast yes. <laughs> that lasts two I hours. Think, I think we, we should do that. But please, people, enjoy music. That's the best. <laughs> yes. Classical music is for everyone. It's the best. And do it. <laughs> do it. Voices to hear.